Big thank you to Fredrickson and Byron for hosting us um, and co-sponsoring the speaker series on women's human rights. This is the third and final one of the summer speaker series, which focused on women's human rights. So we thought we would do kind of a nice, succinct, concise presentation on the top 10 things to know about domestic violence. So that when you leave here today, you've got kind of a laundry list of the most important points that we would like you to take away about domestic violence and our work in that regard. So very briefly, because I know that many of you have already attended these and are familiar with the Advocates for Human Rights, we are a nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1983, and our mission is to implement international human rights standards to promote civil society around the world and reinforce the rule of law. So we provide a variety of human rights services. We provide free legal representation for people seeking asylum in the United States who would otherwise not be able to afford an attorney. Our education team develops curriculum, lesson plans, and trainings. We have an international justice program which does quite a bit of advocacy before the United Nations and the African Commission. And finally, we also have a small school in Nepal where, where children who would otherwise be forced to go and work in child labor are allowed to go there. And we have one rule for that school, and that is if you're going to send your kids, you have to send your girls as well. Now, in terms of our women's human rights work, I will talk a little bit more about this later, but we work around the world to promote women's human rights by helping draft and change laws that protect women. We've published 25 reports on women's human rights. And we train systems actors all around the world in best practice standards. So if you'd like to learn more about women's human rights issues, I encourage you to visit our Stop Violence Against Women website, www.stopvaw.org. So let's talk about the top 10 things about domestic violence that you should know. Now, there are a lot of things you could talk about with regard to domestic violence. And in fact, someone who's working in another area of domestic violence might come up with an entirely different set of top 10 items. But what I'm doing is I am drawing from the work that we do at The Advocates, what we have seen, the trends that are emerging in order to contextualize our top 10. So what I might be talking about might be completely different than someone else who's working as an advocate. So please keep in mind this is contextualized to The Advocates' work. The first four points are going to be about the basic facts and misperceptions of domestic violence. And then the last six points will address what we should keep in mind when tackling the problem as we reform laws and practices. So point number one, domestic violence is a global epidemic. In fact, one in three women around the world will experience some form of violence in her lifetime. And that form of violence may be sexual, physical, emotional, or other abuse. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, 10 to 69% of women stated they have been physically assaulted by their intimate partner at some stage in their lives. And 40 to 70% of female murder victims were killed by an intimate partner. Now, the second bullet point is for heterosexual relationships. Roughly, we know that in heterosexual relationships, women are the victims in 95% of cases. Now, knowing this statistic is actually very helpful when we go out and do our work in countries around the world, because I use that as kind of a yardstick. So if I go into a country and I hear that women are being arrested and charged for domestic violence in one third of cases, I know that something is going awry. Either the language of the law is vague, maybe the police aren't trained in identifying the primary aggressor, or maybe the judges don't know how to assess for defensive injuries. So that is a very good benchmark we are always looking for. And then finally, domestic violence knows no bounds. It affects women of all different social, economic, educational, and cultural backgrounds and it happens in both urban and rural areas. And I always end this point by saying that we all know a victim of domestic violence. Point number two, domestic violence is about power and control. Abusers use violence to maintain power and control over their partner. And they use violence because it works and it achieves their goals. So abusers will rely on a system of power and control tactics that might include physical violence, sexual violence, and other tactics like stalking and harassment. So what happens is that domestic violence victims in turn go to great efforts 
to do what the abusers want, to avoid that violence. They don't go out with their girlfriends, they don't talk back, they strive to get dinner on the table every night on time, they keep their kids quiet and they quit their jobs, and so on. So what we need to do because of this power and control dynamic is that we need to balance that power differential by using the power of the state through sanctions for offenders and protection for victims. The third point I want to make is that alcohol does not cause domestic violence. And I put this in our list because we hear this all the time. Alcohol aggravates, but it does not cause domestic violence. Because what we know is that we can solve the alcohol abuse, but it does not solve the violence. So saying alcohol causes domestic violence is like saying that domestic violence is due to some kind of illness or deficit, for example, like mental health, alcoholism, drug addiction, or brain injury. But in fact, research does not support the idea that abusers have a brain injury or a mental health disorder. In fact, they test normal. Domestic violence is in fact not a disorder, but it's the result of social conditioning that says it's okay and acceptable to use violence against your partner. And when our justice systems fail to intervene effectively to hold offenders accountable, we just end up reinforcing that belief. So I will bring in an example of what we saw in Mongolia, where there is an overemphasis and a high focus on alcoholism. In fact, when police go to a home where they've been called for domestic violence, oftentimes the first thing they would look for is whether or not someone was drunk. And so that's how they would respond, because in their administrative law, not a criminal law, it's a lower level of penalties, they have something where they can put a drunk person into their sobering unit for 24 hours. And that's what they most often were using to respond to domestic violence. Go to the scene of domestic violence. Is somebody drunk? OK, let's take them away to the sobering unit for 24 hours. Well, that's problematic in and of itself, because you're blaming the alcohol, not the offender's behavior or holding him accountable. But it also creates an additional problem, because relying on alcohol use as a reason to detain an offender runs the risk of leaving behind a dangerous perpetrator if those sobering units are full. In fact, we had spoken with a shelter psychologist who talked about one of her clients. And her husband would come home, get drunk, and beat her. He used sharp objects, and he would cut up all of her legs. In fact, she showed the shelter psychologist the scars on her legs. When he came home drunk, she would try to flee, and he would end up tying her hands and her feet, and then putting her down inside one of those holes in the streets where the water pipes flow. That's a really dangerous perpetrator. But when she called the police for help, they said, well, all of our sobering units are full. So they just left him at home. So this same attitude not only starts or stops with the police, it can actually permeate the entire justice system. And in fact, one judge actually said to us, well, most domestic violence cases are because of alcohol or drunken people. When people have these kinds of attitudes, this ignores the power and control dynamic and it assigns blame to the alcohol rather than the behavior and the offender himself. The fourth point, women leave multiple times in domestic violence situation. What happens is, is that offenders purposefully create and maintain barriers that prevent a victim from escaping that violent situation. So women will attempt to leave the abusive relationship multiple times, on average seven times. So what are these kinds of barriers? Well, let's talk about them. First of all, the perpetrator uses violence and control. He might use physical and sexual assaults against the victim and children or others, and these will escalate when the adult victim tries to leave. He will also use tactics of intimidation like stalking, visitation, or custody fights, maybe even snatching and kidnapping the children. These kinds of tactics also escalate when she tries to leave. And so one thing to keep in mind is that the most dangerous time for a victim is when she tries to leave her abuser. And so that knowledge in and of itself also acts as a major barrier for any woman trying to leave this situation. The second barrier is an economic barrier. There may be a lack of safe housing nearby. There may be loss of income and ability to provide for her children should she leave her breadwinner. There could be a loss of insurance benefits for the victim and the children. 
And in one example that I use quite a bit because I think it illustrates perfectly the example of economic abuse and the barriers that it poses was in Croatia, where a woman did have a job and she did receive a regular paycheck. But every time that paycheck came, her husband forced her to go to the ATM, withdraw all of the money, and hand it over to him. She had no control over the finances. In fact, he used that to further embarrass, shame, and degrade her. And the worst thing he did was he made her beg for money so she could go buy feminine hygiene supplies. That's how bad it was. And for this woman, there was no possibility for her to leave. The economic barriers were so high. The third kind of barrier is a community barrier. In some cases, Police and courts may fail to enforce the law or hold the perpetrator accountable or provide protection for the victim and children. There may be community pressures to stay in the relationship, maybe from the religious community, family, friends, and children. There could be a lack of shelter, support groups, or other social services, and daycare for kids. And finally, there may be barriers faced by immigrant women. And in fact, we did write a report back in 2004, if you're interested in learning more, about the kinds of barriers that immigrant women victims of domestic violence face in Minnesota. Language barriers, fears of deportation, fears of losing their kids, and of course, community pressures. And the fourth and final barrier that I will talk about are the individual barriers that a victim may face. She may be experiencing effects of trauma from the violence, like physical injuries, depression, substance abuse, or suicide attempts that may actually act to immobilize the adult victim. She may believe in the offender's promises to change, and she may hope that the violence will stop if she can just please the perpetrator. And finally, there may be the belief that the violence is her fault. One story that I use to show these kinds of barriers and how they play out and why women try to leave so many times happened in Bulgaria, where we met with a victim. And in this case, she had a young son. Her boyfriend was extremely abusive. He beat her constantly. And in fact, the last time he had seen her in a park plaza, a public place, he tried to kill her by cutting her throat. In fact, she showed us the scar from that. So she would try to flee from him. She would go from city to city, but he could find her. And back then in Bulgaria, there was no domestic violence law that would have afforded her protection against her abuser. So what ended up happening in that case was she ended up marrying him. Because to her, that was the safest way that she could protect her own safety and keep herself safe because he kept on coming after her. So this is an example where a woman, even though she tried to leave multiple times, couldn't. And there are multiple barriers that women may be facing in these scenarios. I have a question. Yes, please. around the world, um, does, it, does it change, or is that seven times somewhat constant throughout different geographic areas? The seven times is on average, and I'm not sure. I would assume that that's on average around the world, but I can look into that and get back to you. That would be great. The original question was whether or not um, seven times is around the world or more localized, because during the recession, women were trying to leave more often. Is that, what, is that correct? Yes. in 08 that um, it used to be like seven times, but now with the crash in 08, they were finding it was eight to 10 times. It was even greater. It was worse, yep. Okay, this is the average that I have seen most consistently, but it's possible there are other statistics. So thank you for sharing that. So how do we address this? So moving on to the next points. Well, first of all, you need laws that give victims protection. I will never forget the time in my career working for the advocates where I first learned the power of the law. We were in Tajikistan talking with Tajik police back in 2005, and these Tajik police would say to us, we come, we run to the house, because they didn't have cars, actually. They would have to get there by foot. And they could see that the victim was bleeding and crying, and she was injured. But they would shrug and say, we want to do something, but we can't. We have no authority to do that. And that, to me, brought home the power and the importance of having good laws that protect victims and hold the offenders accountable. So one of the most primary and core ways that we can protect victims is through an order for protection law. So let's talk about a few points on this slide. 
First of all, the definition. We want to make sure that any order for protection law has a good definition that includes a wide scope of protected persons. Because one of the groups that we most always, almost always consistently see left out of this are intimate dating partners who do not live together or do not have a child together. And so they have no recourse oftentimes to protection. That leaves out all the dating partners, essentially. In addition, we also see problems when laws are not specific enough about the forms of domestic violence. Sometimes I'll go in and I'll see a law that says domestic violence is physical violence, sexual violence, psychological violence, and economic violence. No other detail. Well, what happens when it's that vague is that it's left to the interpretation of the state actors who are going to be implementing this law. So what we have seen is we have seen police and judges misinterpret psychological abuse to mean name calling, verbal insults, arguments. And so when that happens, the woman also is arrested and charged with domestic violence. In terms of economic violence and domestic violence cases, I actually asked a judge, I said, well, what does economic violence mean to you in domestic abuse? She said, oh, you know, when a woman goes out and uses a credit card too often and gets her hair done too much. That to her was on par with physical violence under their law because of how it was worded. So we want to see good specific definitions in laws. Second of all, the scope of the acts of domestic violence should be broad. They should include physical violence, sexual violence, including spousal rape, which is oftentimes left out, and coercive control tactics that keep a woman under the abuser's control, and of course, stalking and harassment. And I bring up stalking and harassment because I don't always see that in laws. We're starting to see it a little bit more, but I have seen some laws that omit that. So in one country, they did have an order for protection. It was a good order for protection that ordered the perpetrator to stop beating the woman, ordered him to stay away um, a certain specified distance, and also to leave the home if that was ordered. But what it did not prohibit was a prohibition against stalking and harassment. So really smart abusers learn to work their way around the order for protection. And instead of venturing within 200 meters of the victim, they might come within 205 meters. Instead of coming back to the home they were evicted from under the order for protection, they might drive down the street in front of the home where she lived. So technically, they were not violating the order for protection. But if that law could be readjusted so that we could prohibit the perpetrator from stalking and harassing the woman, then we would be able to hold them accountable for those kinds of actions. Third, let's talk about the length. We want to see an order for protection that can be kept in place for long enough. Ideally, we would like to see it, um, the international standards are one year, but ideally we would like to see it left in place permanently. Some countries do this. India and Colombia have lifetime OFPs that someone has to come forward to actually get it removed. In Minnesota, our order for protection actually can be extended up to 50 years in extreme cases. Cases where the perpetrator has committed two or more acts of violence or where the perpetrator has violated that order for protection two or more times. Now, I have seen inadequate order for protections where the duration is far too short. Anybody want to take a guess as to the shortest order for protection length we have seen? Anyone? One day, okay, that's really short. <laughs> but you know what, that's not unheard of. The shortest duration I have seen in a country that we've been working in was 10 days. And that is not enough time. Because within that 10 day window of time frame, she actually had to go back and she could get an extended for another 30 days, but she had to act within those 10 days. 10 days is not enough time because she might be getting her life in order. She might be changing the locks in her door. She might be looking for a new job and so on. And so if she missed that filing extension deadline within 10 days, she would have to wait for a new act of violence to occur. So she should get another 10 days of protection. So ideally we wanna see a good long order for protection. Fourth, in addition to a regular long-term order for protection, the law should also provide for an emergency ex parte protection order that can be issued immediately on an ex parte basis without a hearing. So when this happens, either the victim or the perpetrator can also later request a hearing, so it's still fulfilling everyone's due process rights. In terms of remedies, we want to see that the order for protection grant the victim a number of remedies like eviction, 
staying a certain distance away from the victim, prohibiting the perpetrator from contacting, stalking, or harassing the victim, or even using a third party to do so. That's very important. Barring the perpetrator from further acts of violence, and banning the perpetrator from possessing or using a firearm. And I want to make a quick note about eviction, because I think that one of the biggest problems we see when we go overseas and do our work is that oftentimes state actors are very reluctant to order the perpetrator out of the house. They see shelters in the area. Why can't the woman just leave and go seek safe shelter? Where is he going to possibly go? The poor perpetrator, this is his home. These are the kinds of um, justifications we hear made for not evicting him. But let me illustrate how the problems play out when perpetrators are not evicted. And I've heard this in multiple countries where we've gone, this exact example. A judge might issue an order for protection. And that order for protection orders the perpetrator to stay a certain distance away from the victim. But it doesn't order him out of the home. So they are expected to go on living together in the same home, and the victim is supposed to walk around the house as though she's got this invisible bubble around her protecting her from her abusive perpetrator. That's absolutely futile and does nothing to promote her safety at all. And finally, we want to see the order for protection available for the victim through the civil system. Typically, civil systems, as we all know, are faster, there's a lower burden of proof, and it can oftentimes be a gateway to other services for the woman. That said, the criminal system should also have its own corollary, corollary protections for a victim should a prosecution be underway. So I'm going to give you an example of what happens when you do not put an order for protection in a civil system and the problems that can play out. In Croatia, there, it has two penal systems, a misdemeanor, penal, a misdemeanor system and a criminal system, which are totally separate. They're totally separate courts, in fact, in totally different buildings with different laws governing them. But Croatia decided, instead of putting its order for protection law in the civil system, decided, let's put it in the misdemeanor system. So if a woman wanted to seek protection for herself, like an eviction, a restraining order, she could go and do that before a misdemeanor court. And at the same time, that misdemeanor judge might also hand down a misdemeanor sanction a fine, or up to 90 days jail. Now, something happened after that. Um, there was a case where a man was beating up another man at a train station in Croatia. It had nothing to do with domestic violence whatsoever. So the Croatian authorities decided to prosecute him. They prosecuted him under the misdemeanor system, and they got a conviction. Then they decided to prosecute him underneath the criminal laws, and they got a second conviction. The problem was, anybody want to guess? What's the issue with this? It's double jeopardy. Thank you. And so this man, who had been convicted twice under the misdemeanor and the criminal laws of Croatia, took his court, he took his case to the European Court of Human Rights, which has jurisdiction over many countries in Europe. And the European Court of Human Rights said, no, this is double jeopardy. You have to choose one or the other. You cannot go after somebody and use both laws. So pick one of them. So what impact did this have on victims of domestic violence who had nothing to do at all with this case? Well, what it in fact meant was that women, these victims, had to choose between getting protection for themselves and a very light slap on the wrist. We're talking 90 days jail sentence, perhaps, even if he broke bones in her body or caused permanent disfigurement. Or if he was so dangerous, then the state could criminally prosecute him so he could actually get up to five years in jail but she would be left without any protection for herself. She would need to wait for a separate act of violence to occur so that she can go back and use that misdemeanor law. So since then, Croatia has amended its laws and realized the problems it's posed, but many other countries in Europe still do have their orders for protection placed in the misdemeanor system. And because the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence applies to many of these countries, this decision is also applicable. So this is just one of the consequences of what happens when uh, countries choose to house their order for protection law outside of the civil system. So moving on, point six, let's talk about the criminal system. First of all, criminal law should clarify that domestic violence is a distinct crime, including assaults that involve low-level injuries like cuts, burns, and scrapes. And laws should make clear that police and prosecutors must pursue all cases of domestic violence and not treat them any less seriously than any other crimes. And these criminal laws are really the government's chance to communicate that message 
of zero tolerance to the public for domestic violence. In addition, violations of an order for protection should be a criminal offense independent of any violence or any threats of violence, and that should provide for jail time. So it is actually enough if he calls the victim to say hello or sends her flowers. He is breaking that order for protection, and he needs to be punished for it to be effective. Now, this violation should be a separate offense prosecuted that in addition to any other criminal acts that happen at the same time. So if he comes to the house after he has been evicted and he beats the victim, he should be prosecuted for two criminal offenses, one for breaking the, violate, the order for protection and two for also physically assaulting her. If the perpetrator repeatedly violates the order for protection, what we want to see is that criminal penalties become more severe with each violation. So in Bulgaria, we've been working there for many years, and one thing we saw when they first passed their domestic violence law was that they had a great order for protection. In fact, their law is modeled on Minnesota's law, which is kind of nice. We've been working there in partnership for many years. Um, but the problem was, was that the order for protection merely said that a violation of an order for protection will be punished by 24 hours arrest. So there was complete confusion by everyone in the justice sector. What do we do with him? Do we just arrest him? Is this actually a crime? Um, is, it, does this fall underneath our criminal laws as well? It was actually a civil order for protection. So it led to inconsistent implementation of the law, and it also led to merely 24 hours arrest of perpetrators who violated the orders for protection. Well, pretty soon they knew that people were going to figure out that, hey, this law really doesn't have any teeth. The worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to spend the night in jail and be out again. So once they realized that, based on a report that we did with our partner, Parliament went back and they amended it. And they specifically, in their law, put down the violation of an order for protection will be a crime. I want to use the next two points coming up, point seven and point eight, to provide a couple of specific examples of what we want or what we don't want laws to look like. So mediation. Mediation assumes equality of parties. But the power and control dynamic in domestic violence means that inequality can never be remedied despite the skills of a trained mediator. Because one party at that mediation table is always going to have more power than the other person. And in fact, if you think about it, no matter how skilled and how trained that mediator is, that offender can always be using secret signals that are unknown to the mediator to intimidate and coerce the woman sitting across from him. So one of our judge trainers always uses this example, where she said, there was this case where there was mediation going on, and the perpetrator said to the victim, you know, I am so sorry for what I did to you. Um, let me make it up to you, and I'll take you on a picnic. How does that sound? Well, to the mediator, it sounds wonderful. He sounds penitent, and it sounds delightful. But to the victim, she might be remembering the last time they went on a picnic, and he beat her with a stick. In another case in Moldova, we did fact-finding. And someone else described at the mediation table how every time the offender wanted to intimidate the victim, all he had to do was crack his knuckles. And that was enough. But it's not necessarily something a mediator would pick up on. When I'm looking at laws and checking out the kinds of policies that the country uses with regard to this, I'm not only looking for language on mediation, we also keep an eye out for other buzzwords like reconciliation couples counseling. Those are all words that are red flags that suggest mediation may be going on. Point eight, we also want to see child custody presumptively go to the victim. Now, what oftentimes happens is that agencies may decide, hey, a victim is not an unfit parent because she was unable to leave her abuser or she was unable to prevent her child from witnessing the violence. And when laws allow the state to take away a child from the nonviolent parent, they end up re-victimizing the victim. So what we want to see happen is we want to see laws create a presumption against granting custody of the children to the violent parent. And in fact, courts should be authorized to order child custody and child support to the nonviolent parent. In fact, 
Legislation like family and children's laws should reflect a rebuttable presumption against granting custody of the child to the violent parent. So for example, what we would like to see in child custody laws is the inclusion of domestic violence as a relevant factor in considering the best interests of the child. Now, in addition to child custody, we also need to think about the other aspects that go hand in hand with child custody issues, like child visitation. Are states and governments providing adequate protection during child visitation? In one example, we heard about um, a country that really didn't have supervised visitation centers. So it was up to the victims themselves to have to arrange the meeting place and to hand over the child to the violent abuser. Well, in one case, a woman met her violent abuser in the park. She was a little concerned, but there was no other recourse for her. So it was a small baby and a two-year-old. And when they were sitting on the bench, her violent ex-husband pulled out a gun and shot her and then killed himself. And she fell over on top of the baby she was holding while her two-year-old daughter ran out in the street saying, Daddy just killed Mommy. And so you can see what happens when there's not adequate protection in place. It's not just a matter of child custody, it's also making sure that all the other factors that go along with it are addressed. In another example in that same country, we heard about a woman who had not been awarded custody of her child because she happened to be staying in a domestic violence shelter. And the social workers in that country said that a shelter was a bad environment for children's development. So they took her child away and they put that child into a state institution. So when that woman left the safe refuge of the shelter to go visit her child in that state institution, that's when her abuser was able to find her and kill her. So these are all these kinds of considerations that we want to be thinking about, not only for the best interest of the child, but also for the women and the victims. Um, in domestic violence. Point nine, we also want to see certain measures to ensure there's effective implementation. Legislation should provide training on domestic violence and law for all sectors, and these kinds of trainings should always be developed in consultation with or even led by NGOs, because they know best what their victims and their clients are seeing, they know what's working and what's not working. And trainings can really make a difference. We did a training in Moldova in uh, November of a couple years ago, and one prosecutor who had been prosecuting for 20 years actually said after the training, this was a great training. I know now that when a victim goes to the police about domestic violence that she is actually not lying. So you can see that these trainings not only can give them best practice standards, but it can also change hearts and minds and attitudes. So that's really critical. Monitoring to see how laws are changing is also critical. Monitoring can use quantitative and qualitative methods to see what's working. How can we fix that? What do we need to amend or what do we need to fix? Laws should also require an adequate budget by the government. It should fund specific implementation activities and it should also fund NGOs to help with implementation. Because time and again we have heard from NGOs that the law provides for a really great measure like a shelter but then there's no funding to bring that law into reality. So adequate and consistent funding is imperative. And in fact, there was one country I went to where many of the shelters were still waiting on funding from the government. And so I actually visited two shelters in two separate cities where the women working in that shelter said to us, we don't have any more money anymore, so right now we're all working as volunteers. And one of them actually said, we're working with the heart now because it was so important to them to keep the shelter open, so they were doing it for free. Finally, the fourth point we want to see for effective implementation is interagency cooperation. Because when all the different sectors, police, the bench, social workers, um, business leaders, employers, so on, when they all coordinate their efforts to protect victims and hold perpetrators accountable, these efforts are more successful. So I cheated here and I included a 9.5 <laughs> because no matter how I worked it, I said this is too important, we have to include this. <laughs> so the one thing that we also want to see in laws in any sort of countries, governments and policies is that victims rights and services are addressed and they are prioritized. So I want to highlight just a few of these, like victim autonomy. Victim consent should always be sought before taking a victim to a shelter or before applying for an order for protection. Also, information to victims is incredibly critical. We want to make sure that first responders who may be coming in contact with women who are victims, maybe they are police, maybe they are doctors, 
they should be obliged to provide her with information like referrals and her legal rights. And finally, the third point I want to highlight is about victim receipt of services. Victims being able to receive services should not be conditional upon their cooperation with authorities or whether or not she's a resident or a citizen. And let me give you an example. We haven't quite started monitoring in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it is a country that we are hoping to work in. And in our initial research, one thing we learned is Bosnia is composed of two separate legal entities. The, there's the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is yellow. And then the red part is called Republika Srpska. They have two separate laws, two separate legal systems, and so on. Well, down here in the bottom yellow bubble that you see, there's a small city called Trebinje. It's very tiny, and it's in the Republika Srpska. And I met with our NGO partner there. And she said, I really want to build a shelter here. We need it so badly here. Because if a woman needs shelter, she can't go to the nearest shelter in Sarajevo. She has to travel almost twice as far up north to Banja Luka because she's not a resident of the Federation. And so when you look at how these kinds of things play out, it's one country. And certainly there are shelters throughout that country. But the way they are implemented and the way that a victim can qualify to receive these present barriers to the actual receipt of shelter. So that's one example of why we want to make sure that not only are victim services provided for in law, but that they actually work in reality. The tenth and final point I want to make is that we can change this. It's not a hopeless situation. And we have met and worked with so many amazing women's human rights defenders around the world as well as right here in this community. It takes, it takes all of us, and we have incredible people working at all different angles. So what does the advocates do? Well, we can break it down into four main points. First of all, we go after the language of the laws. Oftentimes, governments, NGOs, even the UN will come to us and say, hey, this country is about to pass a new domestic violence law, or it's about to amend its criminal laws. Can you take a look at it? That is our chance to get in on the ground floor before that law is changed by parliament to make that law's language the strongest it can possibly be. We've had the chance to look at a law, I think it was from Lithuania, where the law on domestic violence provided for shelters for abusers, should they be evicted from the home, but failed to provide any shelters for the victims themselves. So that's one example where you can go in and you can change the very legal foundation for victims of domestic violence. Second of all, we do monitoring and documentation. We go in and we do lots of fact-finding interviews with all different state actors. We're talking police, judges, social workers, uh, as well as others like doctors, NGOs, lawyers, and sometimes the victims themselves. In fact, uh, we have one person who volunteered with us, Megan over there, who came with us to Montenegro to do fact-finding, monitoring, and documentation. Teresa is also doing quite a bit of monitoring and documentation, so if you have questions about it, feel free to approach any of us afterward. But this is our chance to go in there and really talk in depth to find out what are the problems, why are they happening, maybe it's the language of the law, maybe it's because there's not adequate training or funding, and then make recommendations to fix those. We also do trainings, and I described those a little bit earlier about how our trainings uh, target state systems actors we not only bring over the best practice standards, but also the tools and the methods so that they know how to fix the situation. Um, and what, one thing that we have found is very effective is to bring over a peer professional. So when we're training judges, we look for a volunteer judge who will come with us to train. Or same for the police officer, because it's very powerful for our audience to hear from their peer professionals. And finally, we do advocacy. And one point that I want to make throughout all of this is that when we are doing this, we are always working in partnership with an NGO on the ground inside that country, driving the change from within. So our advocacy is actually doubly effective because our partner is not only doing advocacy within their country from the ground up, but we're also doing whatever we can stateside to bring pressure from the international top down. So oftentimes we will go before the United Nations. We will write reports and we will do in-person lobbying to bring that pressure down from the United Nations onto the government itself. So actually, I've been calling it putting the government into a pressure cooker because we've got the advocacy and the pressure coming from our NGO partners from the ground up, and we've got that pressure that we are leveraging from the United Nations on downward. And so that can actually lead to change. 
So here's one example. In Mongolia, we met with a victim of domestic violence in a very small town, which had very few resources. And in Mongolia, they do have a domestic violence law that provides for an order for protection. And it's an OK law. The problem is everybody in Mongolia knows that that law is nothing more than a piece of paper when you get that order for protection issued. It's pretty ineffective. No one enforces it. And it actually puts you at greater risk because now the offender is really mad. So the order for protection is useless. So she never bothered to go after an order for protection. Next, she did go to the doctor after she had some broken bones that were sustained after 30 years of domestic violence from her abusive husband. But when she went there, uh, the doctors actually said, go and file a criminal report. So she hand wrote out her entire 30 year history of abuse, brought over all of her medical documentation that she had from the hospital to the police because she wanted and was ready to file criminal prosecution charges. The police then lost all of her paperwork. So that option was then closed to her. Next, she wanted to file for divorce because that was another remedy that perhaps she could escape this abuse because he was threatening to kill her. When she tried to do that, she realized that he had burned the marriage certificate. So she was in the process when we spoke to her of trying to track down new documentation so she could actually get a divorce and get away from him. She also wanted to seek safe shelter, but the nearest shelter was five hours away in the capital city because that was the only shelter in the entire country of Mongolia. So that was no longer an option. When we met with her, her husband was put away in prison for 30 days. I'm not for sure what for. And he was going to be coming out in five days. And she said that he had told her, when I come out, I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. And so that day, it was one of those moments where you're standing there and you're thinking, this woman is going to die. We have to do something. And it's outside of our mandate to actually go forward when you're doing an interview and to try to do some sort of advocacy on the ground. But we had very little choice otherwise. So what we did was we made a safety plan for her. We looked online, we downloaded the safety plan, we printed it out, and we worked with the interpreter to pick out what would make the most sense for her. Practice, uh, find an escape route from your house and practice getting in and out of it. Keep your documents and your important identification papers at a friend's house. Get some numbers into your cell phone on speed dial for people who you can call for immediate help, and so on. That was the short-term solution. But long term, what we do is that we publish a report identifying these and other kinds of problems and recommendations on how you fix them. Then we took this report and we went to the United Nations and we did advocacy before the Human Rights Council there. While our partners in Mongolia on the inside used that report and collected 9,000 signatures to bring before parliament demanding change. And within the year, parliament changed and now, for the very first time in Mongolia's history, domestic violence is a crime. So change can happen. Uh, it does, it's not without uh, attacking many different fronts to do so um, and using many different tools to be able to accomplish it. Um, and of course, Paramount, throughout all this work, is a good, effective partner on the ground. So finally, I just want to end with what you can do. Of course, educating yourself, coming to events like these. The Advocates offers a number of different CLEs. We're starting up our human rights film series very soon. Um, and we always have a number of educational programs going on, as well as other organizations in the community. I encourage you to raise awareness, volunteer with an organization. I know that we have some big volunteer opportunities coming up at the Advocates with the State Fair. We have a booth there, and that is our chance to do some outreach to the public at large. And in fact, our theme is going to be a human rights analysis of the political sphere with the elections coming up. So we'll be telling people who come visit our booth, how do you analyze the political candidates with a human rights hat on? You can also donate, donate to a women's organization, lobby your elected representatives, and finally, celebrate the successes. We do see really incredible achievements and progress being made by women's advocates around the world, and so people are doing amazing work. So I have actually brought some Save the Date uh, cards over at the table by the CLE sign-in sheet. So if any of you are interested, we are going to be celebrating our successes, and you can come and celebrate that with other community supporters at our Women's House Party on September 11th. So thank you very much. And I will now open it up for questions or comments. Yes. I have an interest in time I spent in Arizona with uh, domestic violence resources in Mexico. Mexico and the Northern Triangle, Central America, either through the advocates or through other groups of similar kind that you network with. Uh, 
Do you know of groups working in those regions? In Arizona? Well, who would work, I, I was thinking more people who are in those countries who need help. Uh, I hear about it in Arizona because we have a lot of people who flee uh, Central America as well as Mexico where they have experienced domestic violence. And I'm wondering if there's any effort in those countries uh, to better the situation as you've described in uh, Asia and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. We have not historically worked in Latin America, and it was because the women's movement was so strong there, whereas we saw a greater need coming from Central and Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union. That said, of course, there are still women's human rights violations happening on a large scale, driving the refugee flows. Um, in terms of finding organizations in that region, what I typically do is I start with, um, a ma I will Google and ma start with the main root organization that I know is working worldwide and see who they might be partnering with and find organizations like that. Um, I think Equality Now might have a greater L Latin American focus, um, but it's, it's primarily starting and just looking at organizations you respect and seeing who they're partnering Where with. Where they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We do. Yeah, and we see a lot of elder abuse. And I focus this presentation on violence against women, but we oftentimes see in-law abuse as well, going I, both ways. I was going to say, when I, when I worked in law school in a domestic violence clinic in Tennessee, I, I was taken aback when you said that 95% of victims were female, mm -hmm. because I would have said my experience were at least 20 to 30% were male and typically elderly. Mm -hmm. And in Tennessee, half of the domestic violence situations we saw were grandchildren or children uh, abusing typically couples, if not solo, you know, uh, elderly people, typically to steal money from them and steal uh, uh, medication from them. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of prescription pain medication abuse going on. But that was, that was a huge issue that was half of what we dealt with there. Wow, that sounds like a very pervasive problem. Yeah. So it was children abusing their... It was adult children abusing their grandparents most of the time. Elder abuse, yeah. And that is an issue. Our work primarily focuses on violence against women, but it definitely intertwines. Other vulnerable populations does come into play. So thank you for bringing that up. Right. Yes, Megan. Hi, as Rose mentioned, I was a volunteer in Montenegro a year ago doing monitoring on domestic violence issues there. And one of the things that we saw was um, Rose and I went to this meeting oh, yeah. that was an example of different sectors and government trying to work together to, to solve a specific domestic violence problem. And it was chaos. <laughs> um, you know, there was a doctor, and there was a social worker, and there was a prosecutor, and there was a police officer. And, you know, there are definitely people there trying to solve a situation, and nothing was accomplished. So I'm just wondering if you have developed any um, recommendations or protocols that you use when you're advising countries who are working in cooperative measures. I know that was one of the things on your slides. Mm -hmm. And that we're seeing a real movement toward that, so I'm glad you asked that question. I think one of the first things is making sure you get the buy-in of all of the state, all of the state and NGO actors involved. It should be NGO driven by someone, a civil society organization that's working directly with victims. And maybe that takes the form of a memorandum of understanding. One model template that I actually just sent over to Serbia for a police officer who's trying to do the exact kind of work there is the St. Paul Blueprint for Safety which outlines the cooperative arrangements they have going on to address domestic violence. Um, so I think it's a combination of first getting the buy-in, the political will, and the commitment of all the stakeholders, especially the high enough level government officials so that everybody will be engaged. And then doing the trainings and getting them involved because Oftentimes, we would go to these countries, like you said, and we would hear, oh, yeah, we're having these case meetings. Whenever a case comes up and there's a problem, we get together and we talk about it. But that might be addressing that one single case, but is it addressing the system's failures overall? So building in a long-term, more sustainable, cooperative, interagency system that can address the systematic failures and change it long-term is key. So thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a really good 
presentation. Uh, I'm a law student from Sweden, mm -hmm. so um, I'm more curious of the European Convention and like I know that you mentioned some cases and like since we have the the Istanbul Convention now mm -hmm. that is so more specific on domestic violence in Europe, but it's not a lot of countries that have signed it yet, but Sweden have. Um, so I was thinking about the value definitions of like the European Convention has only like Article 3 and Article 8 that could be violence against people then, but that had been, have been interpreted as domestic violence. But do you think the Istanbul Convention would be um, more like useful if people, uh, if countries will sign that document or have you been working with that? Uh, like have you had some like thoughts about that? So the Istanbul Convention, for those of you who are hearing about it for the first time, is a Council of Europe treaty that is the most comprehensive instrument on violence against women. Of course, we do have other instruments from the United Nations and other regional bodies that address discrimination and other forms of violence, and violence against women, but this is the most comprehensive one that was, re that was entered into force or came, was adopted. Okay. Oh, yeah, 2011. I think Sweden uh, signed it 2014, so it was two years ago. Yeah, exactly. So we have this treaty, but I think only, what are we at, 16 ratifications? I think it's like 14, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, I think it's some countries that are like going to, but they haven't ratified it yet. But it's something like that, 14, but yeah. I think it's a good step forward. I think it provides some good model standards, and I think you will also have a monitoring and enforcement body to actually oversee those countries that have ratified it and how they're actually implementing it. Um, but I think we need to get more countries on board to ratify it and signify their intent to be bound to it, and then also assess how implementation is going as we move forward. Teresa, do you want to add anything? I know that Teresa's yeah, first How will speaker that affect Europe? Is that this. is my main question. Like, Sorry, what? how it will affect your, like, do you think the laws will be more, like, strong or, like, yeah, and as you noted, the Istanbul Convention is very detailed, and so the, the standards and the requirements that are set forth, they are the most detailed in any of the international or regional um, treaties relating to violence against women, which does make it difficult for particular countries to ratify and implement it properly. So yes, it would, it's fantastic to have, and it's got specificity, and it has fantastic definitions and sets forth best practice standards, but it's going to be in the implementation. So if countries are going to ratify it, that's wonderful, but it's making sure that they're actually complying with the obligations, which is the next step. <laughs> yeah. But it does provide one more international standard, one more piece of leverage that we can use when a country has ratified that. So we can, we can hold that country accountable to those standards, like we do if they ratified CEDAW. Does that answer your question? But mm -hmm. uh, uh, not a lot, like, since, since we have a lot of shelters and we have things going on. But, like, um, usually when it's, when it's documents coming from European Council, then you, and it's more, like, Sweden do more things about it because of the fact that it's from the European Council. And, uh, like, their case and other things also. So I'm just curious how, it's so new, so it's not, exactly. it's not like, um, yeah, it's answer my question. But <laughs> it's, I'm still curious of how it will be. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> that is a great point, though. You mentioned that maybe um, European, or, you know, Council of Europe or EU yeah. recommendations and requirements, they may have different impact in a particular country than United Nations recommendations or, or treaty bodies might have. So it's going to be yeah. country specific, yeah. yeah. have the monitoring system there at all, like mm -hmm. the CETA have, and yeah, so I, I think, I hope that it will be better with the uh, instable conflict. Yeah. And actually many, many of the countries that we work in, in Central and Eastern Europe, mostly in the Balkans, many of those countries have ratified the Istanbul Convention, um, or they've signed it and mm -hmm. are in the process of moving towards ratification, so we'll find out together, it, seems, it sounds like. <laughs> Great, so it is one o'clock. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I, we would be happy to stay around if you've got additional questions or would like to chat with us about our work. Thank you so much for coming.